Uh, this new book that I have is a collection of essays trying to relate different aspects of his work to the, our, the modern landscape and where we might be headed. And um, flowers are one of them, but there's nine or ten other ones to, to fool with. And, and I guess I want to just run through some slides and think about those and think about things left to do on him and then I'd really like to hear your comments and questions because as I said I, I usually am doing this on the dry side of the mountains and, and uh, I'm looking for more wet side input here because he works over here a lot as well. So this is a map of what he does. It's actually not a map of what he does. He goes much further than this but he leaves London in 1823 for his first trip. This, does this have a laser pointer on it do you think? No? <laughs> oh well. Anyway, he leaves England in 1823 and goes to New York City. And his first great natural history adventure is at the Fulton Vegetable Market, critiquing their Brussels sprouts and carrots and parsnips and stuff. It's great, quite great. He's 24. Um, he goes all over in the eastern seaboard where everybody is a naturalist. Uh, he goes to Philadelphia, meets William Bartram's niece and Thomas Nuttall and he, he, everybody, all the physicians and all the politicians, he, he meets DeWitt Clinton, who is finishing up the Erie Canal, but also has time to tell him where all the good lady slipper orchids are. Um, it's a really amazing world then, where the early American heroes of ours are into natural history on a large scale. It's a very hopeful kind of a thing. DeWitt Clinton tells him to go west, to get out of this settled country and go look at some wild country, and he takes, he takes the first leg of the Erie Canal that's just open and gets on a steamboat and goes to Detroit goes back across the river to Ontario and gets into some virgin hardwood forest. And it's no man's land, just like it is now. The, the steamboat lets him off on an island where an Indian takes him in a canoe over to the Canadian side. It's sort of in between world. He meets a mixed blood family, British Army officer dad, an Indian mom, and that's the world that he's gonna be in now when he gets back out here. And he can see that it's gonna work, and he can see that there's so much to do in it. So that's pretty neat, and he, he does a really good job of writing a brilliant paper about oaks when he gets back to England that is his ticket. He's, he's just a stonemason's son. He has no connections, but he, the people he gets to know uh, are some of the best scientists, and they have a, the British Empire at this time is sending Scottish kids of modest means out all over the world to collect stuff. And if one of them dies, who cares? And, and they send back all these things so that um, you know, lords and ladies in this very strict class society can have a roadie from the Himalayas before their neighbor does. It's great. And, and that's sort of how his world starts, but it, it gets much, much larger than that when he gets here. He, he comes around the horn to get to the Northwest. He works in and out of the Northwest for 10 years, which is a long run for one of these collectors. Uh, he spends two of them in the middle back in London, and he goes down to California for a couple of them, but to him it's all the same. He, he tries to go to California overland from Portland, the Willamette, the Umpqua, to the Klamath. And that, you know, except for tribal unrest, that's what he would have done. Uh, he goes all the way to Fort St. James, all the way north to Fort St. James, and his intention is to come across that last leg of mountains to Dixon Interest, Entrance, go to Sitka, get up with the Russian fur trade company, who he knows from his time in California, and go walk back across Siberia to London, which is not crazy at all. And if he had done it, our taxonomical the botany would be way more together than it is now. So, so he's, he is not some kind of genius. He's not some kind of Charles Darwin figure, but he's really good at what he does. And he is at the Galapagos 10 years before Darwin, thinking the same thoughts, collecting the same, the same plants and animals, and then having them all rot in bad weather as he goes north. So, so he's working on a pretty interesting scale, and he does his best work in the Northwest, and here's why. Uh, <laughs> is when he gets here, he's just at the transition from the Hudson's Bay Company has bought out everybody else, and they're about to turn this place into an industrial monopoly that extracts furs on a very large scale. It's sort of been small time until 1825 when he gets here. He goes to Fort Vancouver across from Portland when it is a construction site, when it's just being built. And so he sees these beautiful post and sill buildings and sees how they're built. And that's his world. What kind of tree are they using? Uh, again, 
he's coming from Great Britain where he knows two or three species of coniferous trees. He comes here and there's 10 or 12 and it's a very steep learning curve. What do you use for sills? I mean, what's the best one? And, and those are the kind of very practical questions that he's looking at and it makes for great reading as far as what was the landscape like then? How has it changed? And, and it's really a trip because this is right on the outskirts of Fort Nisqually. He saw Fort Vancouver built, he saw Fort Colville built over at Kettle Falls where I am, and he saw Fort Nisqually built at the southern end of the sound. This is Nisqually because it's the first painting we have. Paul Kane's the first painter that's good at this. He comes, he shows up 20 years later. But you can see from here that there's these very formal standard fur trade construction piece on piece. It's a French method on the right, and on the left, it's tribal stuff mixed up with Western architecture. That is great stuff. So for this museum exhibit, we get to build a wall, a Spokane house, which is post on sill and looks exactly like those. But it's a construction site. So they set Douglas up with a tent on the site. He collects junk interminably, fills it up, and they build him a cedar bar cut, which we, for the exhibit, we sort of took off on these things on the left and built one wide open to put all kinds of junk in, to put all the seeds we've been collecting for the last five years in. And it, it, just to do that, just to do that, is this amazing learning experience on, um, what, you know, poles, roofs, walls, and floors, just the kinds of things that go into building, which are exactly what he's after. And, and here's what it looks like. These are, oh, this is great. Th this is uh, hiding my text boxes, which is only, only a, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. This is Salau, which you guys all know. And to the right is the original Douglas collection of Salau, which he did 200 years ago, sent to various people. It ended up in Kew Gardens. For this exhibit, Kew Gardens has no qualms about taking a dozen species specimen papers like this, wrapping them in bubble wrap, putting them in a box, and mailing them royal mail to the museum in Spokane. And they just show up one day. And they are amazing because they have, they have little you know, the, this little cutout piece right here is Douglas's account of the habitat where he got it, where he picked it up. This is the stamps or as it's moving around from place to place. But there's information, there's habitat information on this that you cannot get anyplace else. And the fact that, you know, Lewis and Clark and Archibald Mingus, who had been here before him, had pressed plants and sent them back. That's not that hard to do and just get back these old dried leaves. Douglas's genius is he collects viable seed and sends it back. And the fact that he collects, that he develops a taste for Sal Alberries, which the Chinook people he's hanging around with really like, and he gets to like them. But, he, but that's where the seeds are, right? So you can't eat them all. So he puts them in a jar, puts rum on them so they won't rot, and then the Iroquois come and drink the rum off of his Sal Alberries, and he's beside himself because they're getting moldy. I mean, each seed to get back is an adventure. One splash of seawater in a nine-month voyage ruins the seed. So he's got some work to do, but he gets viable Sal Al seeds back to London. He's still over here. These genius nurserymen who work at this garden that's going to become Q sprout the seeds and start growing it. The London Horticultural Society, who has sent him here, has a seed catalog where they get the best lithographers and watercolorists in London to make a beautiful picture of it so they can sell it in their catalog and make money. So this has all happened in, within, by 1829. This has all happened. The fact that Salal goes back there, becomes a popular shrub, nobody ever likes the berries because they don't taste like the ones they're used to in Britain and then gets away and becomes a pestiferous weed that people in Scotland and Scandinavia will say, oh God, Douglas, what an idiot. He brought this salal over here and now it's all gone crazy all over the place. Makes you, makes you think twice about how landscapes work here. So that, again, that's one plant. He sends about 625 back. And, and there's all kinds of things that happen to each one of those. This is, uh, on the left is red flowering currant, which of course is a beauty. The British love flowering shrubs. He sends it back, and this remains the most popular flowering shrub in Great Britain today. And it gets published in 1829. They're paying Douglas 100 pounds a year, which is about what a fur trade clerk gets. And then the bot, the, and in the seed catalog, you have to have a write-up, right? And in the write-up, it explains the attributes of the plant, and then says, 
the proceeds from this one shrub have more than paid for Mr. Douglas's wages and his passage and all his expenses during his trip to North America. Because that's, again, that's one plant. The one on the right is noble fir, beautiful tree, but there's a problem. True firs, cones, fall apart when they are perfectly ripe and ready to go. And so Douglas finds himself like trying to climb noble firs, which isn't easy, because like all the true firs, the branches, you know, the cones are way up on top, and if you touch them and they're ready, they fall apart. So it's a little hard to get the seeds rounded up for this thing, and he has all these misadventures trying to do it, trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, the single most important thing that we did for this museum exhibit is kept one of these cones whole, and it's in a cabinet that you can see next year when it comes to Tacoma. But, but um, there's, a, there's a piece written about these noble firs on the balance sheet of the Horticultural Society saying that by 1830, they're selling a single sprout for five pounds. One, one will get you five pounds. And it is today one of the most, if you go to an arboretum from around some manor house in Great Britain, you'll undoubtedly see noble fir there. They're beautiful trees. They don't quite work out for timber, but Douglas is really looking for timber as he goes along. That's a big part of it. But that's a tiny part of it. Because what really becomes important as far as we are concerned, as far as people who live here today are concerned, is the fact that to get into this stuff, to get into the habitats and the, and the interesting plants that he's really after, he has to talk to people. It's all local knowledge, as, was, as is any kind of botanizing or fishing or hunting or anything. It's all local knowledge. So he has to learn tribe by tribe who is going to handle him, who's going to send him around, who is going to know stuff. And, and the big difference between Douglas and everybody that has come before him is that he's not on a fur trade payroll. Every white guy who's been here before him has either worked for the US government, in the case of Lewis and Clark, or is a fur trader. So Douglas is not that. And so he doesn't have to go to a village and speak to the headman directly and go through these nation-to-nation -nation kind of political channels. He's not important. So he goes to where the botanical knowledge lies, which is always on the feminine side of the equation. So he has 12-year-old kids guiding him around. He goes to, they take him to their house for supper, and he ends up watching the lilies that he's trying to get be baked in an earth oven and eats them. That's the kind of deep plant knowledge that you have to have to do a good job at what you're doing. So that, that really goes a long way. And, and to look at the different tribes who he interacts with then and now really has become the real pleasure of doing this. I mean, Douglas, is, Douglas has a reputation as being this, this uh, bumbling fool who just sort of stumbles around and eventually stumbles into a cattle pit trap and dies. But he's way more than that. But he is spacey, and he never knows where he is any, exactly. But, and so you can read his journal when he goes from uh, Cape Disappointment to Willapa Bay to Grace Harbor and have no idea what he's talking about, about how to get there. But if you go there with um, particular Chinook Shoalwater families or Chehalis families that are living in Grace Harbor, and you go there at the time of the year and show them what resources he's talking about, they'll take you on the exact road and go to the exact gathering site, which has that same name on their place atlas where Douglas got whatever their thing is. It's astonishing. And it all is built around language, as, men, as much culture is, of course. Chinook jargon is a trade language that was developed before white people came, but really blew up when the otter men came, the sea otter people came from Boston in 1787. So it's had, you know, it's had 30, it's had decades to develop by the time Douglas gets there. And it works from Grays Harbor to Tillamook Bay and all the way up the Columbia to, to Salago Falls. He learns it very quickly. The first guy he meets is a Scottish agent. All the Hudson's Bay Company agents are Scottish and clerks. They're all Scottish. Most of them are Scottish kids of modest means who are second and third sons, so they couldn't inherit their dad's craft or trade. They're just like Douglas. Douglas is a second son of a stonemason, otherwise he'd be a stonemason back in Schoon and in Perthshire and never would have gone anywhere. So it just, it's just serendipity that all this happens. They're just like him. Many of them are from small villages just like him. He's among his peers just by coming here. The only difference is they all have tribal wives. There's no white women in this world. They all have tribal wives. And the trick becomes, and this shows up in fur trade records, 
what tribe, what band, what family is your wife from? He meets these people. The first guy he meets is a Scottish guy who's married to a daughter of Concomaly, who's an important Chinook headman from the Oregon side of the mouth of the Columbia. And the people who are living, there's people living on the shoal water who are descendants of Concomaly, and they can just walk you up. They can just walk you up to their resource gathering places all the way to Grays Harbor through Concomaly. There's one guy, one family. Many of the people Douglas met at Fort Vancouver had plateau wives and were just down there bringing their furs down or something, but they were married to Spokane or Cayuse or Walla Walla. <coughs> that's a whole different body of plant knowledge. I mean, that's a different world. And Douglas realizes, <laughs> whoa, this could expand my universe a little bit here. And they're all saying, he's supposed to go back the first summer after he's done one summer of gathering. But how can he go back before he sees the Blue Mountains or the Okanagan or the Rockies or the Bitterroot? So he, he, he sort of gets cut loose. And it's all because he's been inside people's houses. So somebody's going to tell me, I guess, how to get these little boxes off. Here. <laughs> I think I'll switch. Does this work? Oh. Oh, okay. So, here are some paintings from the London Horticultural Society of familiar, totally familiar plants, seashore lupin and, and bear grass. He knows that they'll be popular plants. One is a beautiful lily and one is a beautiful lupin. That's no problem. But if you are a Chinook person, seashore lupin is a root food that you gather at a certain time of year and bake in an oven. Bear grass is a textile that you gather at a certain time of year, prepare for a year or two years and then weave into baskets as a wrap around a frame, uh, around a base. So, so there's a lot going on with this, and he can't, you know, he can't get into them without learning that. And he has the added wonder of being out in the landscape looking for them. So he's going, oh man, I gotta get some of this bear grass, I gotta get some of this bear grass. But now we know that bear grass, he's having trouble finding blooms because a lot of bear grass blooms synchronistically every three years. You'll see millions of blooms and then you'll go out the next year and won't see any. When it does bloom, the elk are all over it or the deer are all over it eating the buds just before they pop because it's a big nutrition load. So he is, he is competing with a very surprising number of things to get what he needs. And it, it, it becomes this wonderful learning experience where he, he gets his plants, but he also gets a great collection of rodents <laughs> because they're, you know, they're all after the same seeds he is. This, he gets a great collection of seed-eating birds because he's interested in everything. It's just that his job is to get plants. So here's how this plays out. This is three baskets that, that are in the exhibit. The, the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture, the MAC in Spokane, has really, really great Indian stuff, especially Plateau, but also has a lot of coastal stuff. So we were just going to use their stuff for the coastal part of the exhibit. But the family of Tony Johnson, who I was working with on the Shoalwater, said, well, let me see what you have before you decide what you're going to use. And, you know, he looks at the stuff, well, this is pretty nice, but we want the Chinook to look really good here. Um, and we have this pre-contact cooking basket in my family. Why don't we just give it to you for a couple of years so that the people can go look down at it and see all this black goo in the bottom where it's woven tight and you put water in it and then you put hot stones in it to cook supper for 100 years. You sure you want to do this, Tony? <laughs> but of course Tony's sure he wants to do this because it's the Chinook. He's a, David Douglas shrinks in this equation. He wants... He, he, Douglas scores points with him because he's interested in the landscape. He shows knowledge of the plants. He's willing to go out there when it's pouring rain in the winter and look for stuff. But it's the landscape itself and the culture that is important to Tony, and he wants to show it off through Douglas. So that really, that really counts for something. So of course we're putting this in. The one on the left is um, 100 years old, and that's, um, I don't know, 
That's a bit, let's see. The one on the right is a more modern one, and it is a skirpish rush for a base, and then a bear grass wrap that gets you these black figures, because that little purple down on the bottom of the bear grass blades turns dark in time. And you can't photograph it and see this beautiful maroon. Beautiful baskets. But Douglas says that they made this out of Indian hemp, that they made baskets like this and hats out of Indian hemp. And Tony goes, oh no, they did not do that. We used sweetgrass sedge is what they call it, and it took me a long time to identify it as this skirpish rush. So each, each fiber, each textile, each material becomes this whole puzzle. And, and at first, the tendency is to trust Douglas because he's doing Western science and has Latin names on everything, right? But if you go up to somebody and show him some coils of material that were collected two years ago and then had all the edges squared and were carefully prepared, it is not easy to identify those. If you go up and show somebody a handful of roots that have just been baked in embers or come out of a uh, earth oven, it's not so easy to identify those. And I, I've come around to thinking maybe he's not right. <laughs> But their time, okay, so Douglas is wrong, uh, Tony's family is confused, or, you know, things have changed in 200 years. A any of those are possible, and, and, but I, I maintain you can figure it out if you just work your way backwards in somebody's basket collection, or in photographs of the landscape, or somehow there's ways to do it, or in Chinook jargon usage. There's ways to figure this stuff out. It's just that nobody's taking the time to do it, because they're all planning you know, they're all planting bear grass in their garden in England and then trying to keep it alive. <coughs> Every family I is really different. So he sees camas. Camas is important on the coast as a food. He, he has one really good, co very complete recipe for how they're doing it in an earth oven. It's totally different from the families that I see on the, in the interior cooking a plant that actually looks quite a bit different and is, grows in different habitats. I mean, these plants have different aspects depending on where they're growing, and that becomes one of the most interesting parts of the world that Douglas is seeing, and he recognizes that, and it confuses him, and he wonders whether they're different species, or he, he is amazed at how Douglas fir, for instance, can tolerate how it can grow in the Olympic Peninsula and how it can grow in Spokane. That makes no sense, and look totally different and be the same tree. That's hard to get your mind around, so he's, he's fighting with that, as, as we should still, too. And then they start splitting apart. He is carrying this twist tobacco in the middle that's your standard fur trade trade item that the British have that is grown in Jamaica or Brazil or Virginia or wherever, shipped to England, which is in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, which is only about putting a twist in, in, in some kind of thing, in anything that they can get their hands on. And they put it through these machines and twist it into rope and then make these clumps out of it and send it back to the fur trade. And that becomes the standard of any kind of meeting. You cut off one inch, or you cut off two inches, or you cut off three inches. Douglas has that. But as soon as he gets here, he, the, the light bulb goes on that tobacco is a, an American genus. And there are many kinds of it up and down the Cordillera from British Columbia to Tierra del Fuego. And he's in the middle of it. And it's something for him to figure out. So he sees a guy selling uh, tobacco of his own manufacture, is how he says it at the Dalles, and he goes immediately, tries to get some of it. The guy goes, why would I trade my good tobacco that I grew in my plot that I know is good for your junky commercial, industrial, manufactured tobacco? That makes no sense at all. So Douglas does what any of these early explorers do. He sneaks around, thinking he's, that nobody's watching him, and in the Willamette, in a plot of woods, he finds a little patch of tobacco that somebody's growing no differently than we would grow marijuana in the national forest kind of stuff. And he, he gets it, he's sure nobody's watching him and he takes some of it. And he's walked like 10 feet and this guy falls in next to him and goes, hey, I think that that's my tobacco that you're carrying there. But because he speaks Chinook jargon, because he has a lot of knowledge about how to grow plants because he spent a nine year apprenticeship in the garden starting at age, you know, a very young age in Scotland, he's good at growing stuff. He can talk to this guy, and they can talk about how they, this guy found just the right punky snag to knock down and then burn slowly and then spread over the soil so that he could grow his tobacco because it likes fire and charcoal. And that's something that Douglas, that they both can really understand. That's gardening talk there. So Douglas ends up with this 
Nicosia, what we now call Nicotiana quadrivalvis, and you can go identify it as the same quadrivalvis that Meriwether Lewis got in the Mandan villages in North Dakota, and the same thing they're chewing into little cuds with lime in the Queen Charlotte's, and it's native to California and was on a trade circuit that went all over the continent long before white people ever showed up. So again, Douglas becomes a very small blip on the screen in this story. Tobacco is amazing though, but that's only the beginning of the story. There's another species that lives in the interior that's native to the Columbia Basin, and that's the one that he really wants to get, and it never shows up on his plant list. He is in places where this has been traditionally collected several times at the time of year when it should be out, and he can see it. It never shows up. And so then you start realizing that the one in the center is like a habit. That's us smoking camel. The one on the right is I mean, it's, it's a ritual, it's, for, it's been grown, it's all over the place, it's for intertribal communication. Everybody has their own cultivar from it. Their grandmother's got a garden and has their own, just like your grandmother grew her special tomatoes. The one on the left is this very powerful spiritual experience used for very severe diseases and problems of all kinds. Every tribe has different things for it, but it's definitely powerful. And when you get into the spiritual realm of things, you don't let strangers in on it quite so easily. And it's just a, it, Douglas never sees it. Nobody ever sees it. I mean, there's lots of ethnographers who have a, uh, who go out looking for it and they have a blank next to it. They write down the Latin name and then they have a blank next to it. Either out of deference to the tribe, which is certainly possible, you know, if they ask you not to write about it, why would you do it if you're, if you're really working with them? So there's a lot, again, there's a lot to each of these plants. But this, this Indian tobacco that they do the beautiful picture of is the same one that's out in front of Safeway with the petunias in the spring. You know, that's just a cultivar of this quadrivalvis that is the night scenting one that then you get into, then you, all of these spin off into what we would call ecology today, where you're in the desert in eastern Washington, you find some tobacco at night, it, it, the scent starts leaking out of it as the darkness comes on. Sphinx moths, sphinx moths are drawn to it and come to pollinate it. And then the spotted bats come down and then you can sense as your spotted bats. I mean, it just goes on and on. So when he comes into the interior, this is this wonderful loop that he makes. The, the whole thing about how, to, how uh, Douglas is not an explorer, but the way white people come into the country is Lewis and Clark you know, are on a political mission where you go out and back. It's incredibly simple. But, uh, and Thomas Jefferson orchestrates it all. David Douglas, he, he sees a nice flower that he wants and he has to get seeds from it or it does nobody any good. So he has to circle back around. And, and if, it's, if the seeds aren't ripe yet or if a pocket gopher has eaten them, he has to wait a year or he has to come back around two weeks later and he has to figure all these things out. It's much more like a tribal round where you have deep knowledge of the country and you're spiraling depending on conditions, varying, you know, adjusting, being really flexible depending on how things go. And so he spends the summer between Fort Walla Walla, Fort Okanagan, and uh, Fort Colville, which is just getting built. They've abandoned Spokane House, but there's some guys were living down there, a mixed blood family is living down there that he ends up talking to. He goes, follows the flood coolies <coughs> down to the mouth of the Clearwater and the Snake River where he watches uh, a fur trade uh, group trade the Nez Perce for 100 horses and then drive them back up to Spokane. He's just all over the place. And, and it really becomes an amazing summer. He's up in the blues three times. And, and he gets a lot of amazing stuff. And, and it's easy to run through it and just say, uh, you know, these are pretty. He gets a whole bunch of different flocks. But he gets, he writes a letter back to his mentor, William Jackson Hooker. I just collected a pound of flock seed. That's got to be a billion flock seed. I mean, they're, they're more than tiny. But, but he does get several different flocks, including one, of course, that's named for him. There's about 85 things named for him. It's, this is just his buddies back in England who are scientists naming new pretty plants for him. It's, it's really meaningless. It's the tribal name for these things that would indicate some habitat and some, something that would be important now. Uh, he names 15 lupins, I mean, excuse me, 15 penstemons, which are a beautiful dry land plant. 12 of them still have the same taxonomic name to them. That's really amazing. He names 17 lupins, 14 of them still have the same taxonomic name attached to them. So he's working on a very high level when he gets back to England and does the science, the lab work, for it, the inside work. But again, the, the, of course, they're really interested in getting these rights because these are still popular plants in Britain today. Uh, one of his most amazing ones is brown peony. 
which he finds in the Blue Mountains. So he names it, and he writes as soon as he finds it. He knows immediately. Douglas reads all the time. He's got a great awareness of what's going on in the scientific community around him. So he finds his peony. He knows that the Botanical Society has been minting money on peonies from China and doing crosses and cultivars so they can get the kind of peonies that grow in your grandmother's backyard. This is the first one found in North America, so that's going to be all the better. And so he names it for his favorite botanist, Robert Brown, who is a Scottish kid of modest means, who is a genius at plants, who got a hold of uh, the flowers from, that uh, Joseph Banks had collected from Captain Cook's first expedition around the world and became very famous uh, working on them and getting them really organized. And so Douglas goes back to England and sort of, you know, learns from Robert Brown, who's the preeminent bio botanist at the time, and uh, is so tickled that he's got this great plant. They plant a beautiful picture of it. This is the specimen that they sent us from Kew that's in Spokane now, where you can just see what a really good job he did of pressing it, if nothing else. But the great thing, really, to me is, Douglas is walking around London and he writes a letter to somebody, Mr. Brown has just written this great scientific paper. I don't quite understand it, but he's seen these moss spores doing these weird things. And it's Brownian motion, which Robert Brown described in 1829 at a meeting of the Linnaean Society where there's random movement in these tiny plant particles under the microscope, which Albert Einstein explained when he wrote his famous five papers, one of which was relativity, but has to do with particle physics. I mean, Plants explain everything if you look at them closely enough, and Robert Brown is the kind of guy who looks at them closely enough. Douglas is not Robert Brown, but he's, he's feeding him things to keep him excited. And, and again, these kind of cross stories never stop, never stop. Douglas is well aware that uh, he's, he has a copy of Persia's plant book with him that has all of Lewis and Clark's collections in it. So he knows that Clarkia is William Clark's special wildflower that's really nice, but Douglas gets the seed from it, sends it back to London. He knows that bitterroot is this amazing plant that sprouted after uh, Meriwether Lewis, you know, after they collected one and pressed it, it's in it back and it's still sprouted because it's so tough. But Douglas is the one that introduces it to Europe where they, they, um, they put like 10 roofs over it and go out and stomp on it every two weeks to try to keep it alive. I mean, it's just not a good plant to be growing in Scotland, but they love it, so they try. And Douglas writes this amazing line about bitterroot where, where he says, um, it, if you've ever seen the root of it, it's like little threads, little white threads after you peel them off. They aren't big at all compared to the other food roots that the tribes gather on the plateau. But Douglas says, this, this is a very unusual plant. Just a couple inches of this really thin root gives you all this sustenance and will keep you going all day. And he says it in, a, in exactly the same syntax almost that a lot of tribal elders use when they're saying, oh yeah, I was at stick game the other night, I was just flagging out and somebody gave me just like one little thread of bitterroot and then I could sing the whole rest of the night. It's the same stuff and it does have a very complex nutritional profile and it is magic. But it's also Meriwether Lewis's plant, you know, I mean, it's amazing. Same thing here. He collects the Mary sagebrush mariposa lily, which is a beautiful lily. Then he goes back to London and writes a paper. Mr. Lewis collected a relative of this plant, which is Calicordus elegans in the Blue Mountains. But I have found three other ones, including this one. And he goes through and names it. And, it, and understandably, it's the most beautiful of the three. It becomes the most popular plant from a, a horticultural standpoint. But then he says, and they cook this in earth ovens, and it makes this farinaceous, um, uh, really delicious sort of cereal thing when you cook it and then beat it pound it and pound all the stuff out of it. And the uh, Indians in the Columbia Basin call it Kew. So he has a, he often puts names for plants where he has no idea of the language, what it is. But he'll, he goes to the trouble of getting a word for a plant that he likes and writing it down. And that is, in, that is gold for anybody now to take this plant, which only a few families still dig in the basin, but is still very common in places. There's enough to dig, but only a few families still do it. And to take that to them and give them a word, that is giving them something that is clues to this eroded culture that, that they want. So Douglas has value to them occasionally in tiny ways, but each plant uh, is significant. So I'm working with some Wanapum people at Priest Rapids now, and they, uh, there's a really knowledgeable person there that digs about 15 roots, and it drives her crazy 
that elders who died, when she, that she knew, dug 21. And she wants to build those numbers back up, and this is one that, you know, this is now 16 or whatever. So, yeah, she can get excited about that because that collapses that 200 year time period that is not the greatest time for Plateau Tribes. Then, of course, there's Douglas Onion, which is um, a pretty onion. It's the, most pr it's the most beautiful allium onion, so it's a very popular garden plant. But it, Douglas goes out with Spokane people, and they still go out. And when they dig camas in this certain place south of Spokane, there's two onions there. One has already bloomed, and the Douglas onions are just blooming. And the camas has already bloomed. So they pick the camas and, and um, turn the seed head over in the ground and get the root. They pick this onion and turn the seed head over and get the root. They leave the Douglas onion alone, even though it's the most, it's the most beautiful one. And the kids are all going and picking it and making little bouquets. But the roots don't smell strong like onions yet. The other ones are a nodding onion, and they smell really strong, and that's what they want. They want the bitter. They always say, I want the most bitterest, strongest, onionist things that we can get. They want, that's the power of the nutrition in the plant. And so they come back six weeks later and get these Douglas onions. So again, he doesn't have much to do with it, but they remain an important food to some families. And it's not just plants. He does this with everything. When he's at Fort Walla Walla, um, he, get, he sees these horned lizards and he really wants them, but of course adults can't catch horned lizards, only kids can catch lizards or salamanders, anything like that. So he hires uh, Wawa and Cayuse kids to go out and they make these little noose, these horsehair noose traps and they go lay down in the dunes and they sit down in front of a hole and when a little lizard sticks his head out, they grab it and run squealing up to him and he gives them beads or trade goods, you know, what it, stuff that's worth, worth something to them and then they go squealing off to get the fence lizard or to get the sagebrush lizard or to get the night snake, you know, everything that he needs next. And the fact, but, but again, from a scientific point of view, he takes it back to London. I, who knows how he got it back to London? It's hard to keep these things. And gives it to Thomas Bell, the preeminent herpetologist of the time, who was working on his unbelievable Turtles of the World, which has the best turtle illustrations ever done, this big book, unbelievable book. He's the same guy who 10 years later is going to get into Darwin's herps from the Galapagos and, and really get into them. He is the guy who introduces Darwin 30 years later when Darwin presents his origin of species paper. But for Douglas's purpose, he's just this guy who's gonna do this killer drawing that shows the femoral pores on the inside of the thighs that make this a male horned lizard and identify it as a new species. Then he's gonna put Douglas's name in the species. Of course, the genus has changed over 200 years, but we still have to call it the Glacia. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. You have to have the context of this living in the plateau and being the totem reptile of the plateau that the tribes all have stories for. That's where that, the, the Yakima name means something about this. But it's still a cute thing. And the fact that it sits in your hand exactly like Thomas Bell's illustration is still sort of a nice thing. He gets into all these, all these rodents, all these rodents, and he sends back pocket gophers and mountain beaver <laughs> uh, skulls and feet to John Richardson, who is just finishing his big first mammal book of northern North America. William Jackson Hooker in 1829 starts in on the first great flower plant guide of northern North America, and Richardson does the mammal guide, and Douglas really gets a lot of stuff to him. And what's most amazing here is that a lot of the material is not written down in Douglas's journal or in his letters or anywhere that I can find. His papers are in quite in disarray. But in Richardson's book as it's published, it'll have like an addendum that says, you know, before this thing goes to press, I gotta put in this extra thing. Mr. Douglas has just given me a cape of these weird mountain beaver things and there's 32 in the cape and some of them look like this and one of them might be a different species and they're beautifully sewn together and he got it out of will for it. I mean, all this stuff that, that tells us about this animal that Douglas never even saw himself because he could never find it. They were really shy. Meriwether Lewis wanted to get him and could never find him. Douglas wanted to get him and could never find him. Now they're like in everybody's garden in Seattle. So it's an animal that has changed in 200 years. Its behavior according, by, by adopting to people on some level. And you know, it coexisted with Chinook people, but they were making these robes out of them, so I guess they made themselves more scarce. 
But Douglas is at this, he's just at this moment with every one of these things where it hasn't really been codified before and he's resetting the clock on it and starting like a new alternate mountain beaver universe where instead of being these shy things that you never see, they're the ones eating the petunias in your garden. It's just a, it's a very, he has a very strange moment that he showed up here. And, and, and it, it, it has so much to do with the way Europe sees us, meaning the Northwest, because everything he sends back, they have all these artists that he paints. So he drives himself crazy getting sage grouse and sharp-tailed grouse skins. He gets very obsessed with grouse, and he writes a paper with nine kinds of grouse and quail. Terrific paper. And, and um, he sees at Priest Rapids what he describes as clouds of sage grouse on a lek and gets them all up. And she, you know, his goal is to get a perfect male and a perfect female. So he goes through some before he gets that. Then he gets them back, he gets four skins back, and gives the mail to John Richardson for his book with this uh, very long description of what they look like when they're dancing. You know, they get there, they drum the ground with their wings, and they fan out their tail feathers, and they blow up these weird glands, and their eyebrow swells up with blood. All these things that you would never know. And, and he explains it all. And then, the, so this is the painting in Richardson's book by a, by a, what turns out to be a pedestrian painter. This, then he gives the skins without the information to this Scottish artist named James Wilson, who is very little known, and he has this book called Illustrations of Zoology, which is the rarest book we got for the um, museum exhibit. It's so rare that you, that it's, you can't even find it, uh, eBay, eBay copies or with the plates all scissored out, which is the way most books are, like this come now. This was in the California Library, and it's unbelievable. There's about 50 plates in it, and he had this technique of doing bird feathers that 200 years later look like bird feathers, which is very hard to pull off. I mean, Audubon's painting at this time, and his bird feathers don't look like this. He's, he's really got some technique going on, and you can, you can see it in this book. So somehow Douglas is transmitting that to Wilson, who's able to transmit it to us, even though it doesn't look like a sage grouse much anymore because all he has is the skin. You know, again, the context is what's missing here. You just can't, you can't imagine the Columbia Basin if you're in Glasgow. It does, you can't do it. And that is a real uh, lesson about um, why Douglas is imp more important here than he is back there, I guess. I mean, I think, that, I think that here is where we should be looking at him. Even though he's this huge cult figure in Great Britain, here is where it's important. So here's, a, here's another perfect example. He sees all these condors. Uh, Lewis and Clark saw them. Uh, John Kirk Townsend saw them later after Douglas had left. But Douglas asks everybody he meets about them. And he expands their range up the snake. And he sees a big wintering population down in the Umpqua. That's important. And then people are giving him, uh, giving him misleading information. And it's hard to, are they teasing him? Are they just full of baloney? You know, who is telling him this stuff? He gets some bad information and a lot of good information. And it's our job to sort it out. But, you know, as you know, condors, which are sort of extinct, are being reintroduced in the wild in all these places. And the next place they're going to do it is at the mouth of the Columbia. And as soon as they do that, some will blow up river to Spokane so I can see them, and some will blow up the coast so you can see them. And that's the way it was. I mean, there was plenty of condor, uh, you know, Buzzard Bay in Vancouver is condors. So, so that they'll be around. They're just as likely to survive here as they are down there. So I don't know what's going to happen, but they're going to come back. So, so the ones that have been released and died, we wanted to get a, a taxidermy mount for the exhibit. There's, there's no condors around in the world because they're an extinct bird, right? But there's these whole freezer fulls of them, of released captive birds that die of lead poisoning that, that this guy, Igor, who is some kind of genius craftsman himself, is able to put back together and put in the exhibit so the kids can get ready for them to return. So I, I, I am not sure what all this means as far as whether condors are extinct or not. I haven't decided that. But it is nice to have one because Douglas writes so movingly about them and he turns a lot of people onto condors. There's a guy named Samuel Black who is a fur trade agent at Fort Walla Walla who spent his whole career being a bully and a drudge as far as I can tell. And in 1826, Douglas shows up at Fort Walla Walla and the very next year, Samuel Black, who is, uh, you know, has been accused of murdering Indian people on the prairies, is taking down three word list, Walla Walla Cayuse Umatilla, or Walla Walla Cayuse Nez Perce, and getting a word for condor in each one of them. Now that's important. 
you know, because this is way upriver and down on the snake, and they're all seeing condors enough to have separate words for them and an understanding of what they are. Well, that means they should be part of our scene here. And, and obviously were when they were dead salmon to eat. So, so again, it's sort of, uh, it's just another little piece to recreate what Douglas saw. And, and Samuel Black, believe me, he is not the person you would expect to be helping to do it, but he's helping to, to redo it. Another aspect of his work is that he is, uh, he, like many of these guys, he goes back to London and he realizes his shortcomings and how much more he could do if he could learn surveying. So he learns to survey so he can start comparing different places and he learns to do altitudes, he learns biogeography in the sense of Alexander von Humboldt. And he gets up with a guy who's working for von Humboldt to do a chart of magnetic variation in the world by hanging magnetized needles from a tripod, which is hysterical, but also true. And he takes a lot of valuable data when he is back up here from 1830 to 34. And at that same time, Charles Lyell's Elements of Geology comes out, hugely influential on Douglas and Charles Darwin and anybody else who's reading at that time, because it makes them think. And Douglas has hysterical letters that are very, uh, overheated prose saying, if I got all this plant knowledge and if I can put it together with this surveying knowledge and the rock knowledge and I can make it work, I can figure out the world, which is basically what happens to Charles Darwin. So look at this. This is him in Hawaii at the mouth of Kilauea Crater and he's in this liquid molten forming world but, and it cools off and it's eastern Washington. It's where he spent all these years looking for plants. It's, it's like he understands where he's been. And I, as I said, he gets really overheated about it and, uh, and writes all these great things, stays up there at night watching it smoke. And then eventually dies in Hawaii in 1835 at age 36 by falling in a cattle pit trap. And his dog, who's always, he, he's a dog guy, he always has a dog that goes back to England and becomes a cult hero. And his instruments goes back and a lot of his surveying information goes back. And so there's, he has all these different legacies in England. Um, this is a Douglas fir that's one of the tallest trees in Great Britain, if not the tallest tree, and it's, a, it's grown from seed he sent back at the manor house where he did his gardening apprenticeship. You know, that's hard to get your mind around, but it's not a timber tree, it's a, it's a pretty tree. So that's one of them. Another one is all these timber trees that are all over the former British colonies that are weeds to some people and timber to others. That's another one. This is the map that was made with his data and Captain Fitzroy's data on the Beagle and Alexander von Humboldt's data and these famous Russian guys' data and these Americans' data, all of them working together during a time when many of these countries were at war to really figure out how magnetic variation worked on the planet. That's a noble cause to put science in front of politics. And then I guess I think the most important thing he did was through this social dynamic of the mixed blood families that he worked with. He fathered a child by a Spokane girl in 1826, and that kid was killed by Blackfeet when he was young, so he doesn't have any progeny of his own. But he spent years hanging around with this guy, George Barnston, who again, Scottish kid from a village, almost the same age as Douglas, trained in surveying before he joined the Hudson's Bay Company, helped to lay out Fort Langley, did, did all kinds of cool things. And, and when Douglas came back the second time, they uh, and knew how to survey, they really fed each other's interests. And uh, Barnson became this really avid naturalist. And uh, Douglas, when Douglas died, Barnson wrote the most emotional uh, memoir of him, unbelievable. And then he traveled, stayed with the company for the next 30 years, traveling all over BC uh, and the prairies at different posts. And he always collected insect cocoons and would watch them. And he had a tribal wife. This woman, Ellen Matthews, was the daughter of a Clatsop chief and a fur trade guy, your classic mixed blood progeny. And they had 11 children who traveled with them. Some of them stayed behind at different posts as they grew up. So Barnston eventually retired back to Montreal. He brought Ellen and a bunch of the kids with him. And he became, he joined the Montreal Natural History Society, which is a pretty big deal, and publishes a little journal. And he became president of it, and he published a whole bunch of these cocoon papers on insects, which I have not looked at, but would like to. And then one of his sons became a botany professor at McGill University. So this is a mixed blood 
Western Indian coastal something kid who becomes a botany professor at McGill University in the 1890s. That is really amazing. That is an amazing legacy. And you have to think that David Douglas had something to do with that because of the influence that he had on the guy Dan. That's important. And, and that's what I like is the way he infected all these people he met with the enthusiasm for, you know, for the real world, for the landscape and what was around them. So thank you very much for letting me come say that. <laughs> Do we have time for a couple of questions here? Yes, we do. How do we find Douglas's journals? Douglas's journals have been published in sort of valorized, not really tidy uh, editions, and they're all in the, all of his stuff is in the bibliographies of the collector or this new book, A Naturalist at Work. And you can go online and find different versions of them, but they're, they're so mixed up that it really helps to have some explanation of what you're looking at. Because he, he kept a journal. He often lost a journal. <laughs> he copied them over. He went to England and got a book contract and tried to write a draft, tried to write a book that was based on a journal form, like a travel narrative. Then that didn't work out. He tried to write a short form to get another contract. And so they're all sort of floating out there. And they're very difficult to tell apart. He has all these letters. A lot of letters that are really, really cool. And some of those, and some of them are cross-written, so they're impossible to uh, totally read and really hard to transcribe. Some of those are in the exhibit that you can look at, good scans of them. And he has all these comments that show up in Hooker's plant book or Richardson's mammal book uh, as direct quotes from him in, in species accounts. And he has hundreds and hundreds of specimen papers at Kew Gardens. 12 of which are in the exhibit that you can look at. And when, they, when Douglas wrote something down, like habitat information, sees dates, exposures, that kind of thing, you, they cut it out and glue it onto the page. So that's like an original primary document when you look at it. So you can find it, but, but you there's no finding aid for him in his papers, which are at the Royal Horticultural Society. So somebody, that's something somebody needs to do. Somebody needs to put his stuff in order so I can just give you a clear answer. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's, he he's really good at it. I mean, he he in 1826 fall he goes down with a fur trade brigade down the Willamette, and the tribes had burned the prairie there. And the fur trade guy, who also has a journal, this is another great thing about the Hudson's Bay Company, is if you can write, you have to write a journal. So the fur trade guy, Alexander McLeod, is going, God, these Indians are so stupid. They've ruined our whole trip. Our horses can't find them. Douglas is going up to these Kalapuni Indians and saying, why did you burn this? And, and they give him, and his language skills are not working so well, because he's in a new language family here. And so he's very confused about the answer he gets. Robert Boyd's Indian and Fire book, which is also in the bibliography, Robert B-O-Y-D, he edited a collection of essays called Indians and Fire that has great stuff. And in the new book, there's a uh, interview, or there's a, there's a lot of present time in the new book, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an essay on that that deals with uh, the way they burn now in the Oak Prairie. So he describes it mostly from the coast, but when he gets in the interior, he's, he's just delighted by these open ponderosa pine parklands. <laughs> And, and describes the tribes eating cambium and pot roasting pine nuts and stuff. And he's riding through open bunch grass, which is clearly fire um, created landscapes, fire managed landscapes, but he doesn't talk about it in the way that he talks about it in the land. So he's always, he, you know, there's never as much as we want, is the answer to your <laughs> question. But he does distinguish. He, here's one example of how uh, clever he is. When I learned birds as a kid, blue grouse were the big grouse that you saw in western Washington and eastern Washington. It, it has since been changed to sooty grouse and dusky grouse, two different species. Douglas clearly shoots a grouse on both sides of the Cascade Crest and so knows that they're different species and sends them back to Alabama and calls them different species. Because he's here. You know, if you're here, you can tell. So he, see, he does see the difference. That's a really great question. The answer is no, that I can see, because nobody likes salmon berries. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the going, I, this is the conversation you have with Tony about which berries he eats, because most of the things that he sent back from here, the berries never caught on, because you like what you, 
the, the, me the lesson of all of his work is you liked the food you ate when you were little. So he grows up eating, you know, crushed barley farina for breakfast every day. And when he can crush up valerian or that mariposa lily we're looking at, the highest thing he can, the highest praise he can do is say it makes a palatable farina because that's what he wants. And when he sees a, when he sees lamb's quarters or pigweed, which grows in Europe and was already here when he came in 1826. He sees it growing in a near Chinook village and he, he's just gotten here. These Indians are so dumb. Here's this great pigweed growing here and they're eating salmonberry shoots, which if you go to the shoal water, as soon as the salmonberry shoots start, start coming up in April, they're, they're all eating them. Even though some, even some families who don't think of themselves as cultural at all, they're used to eating them because they're so good. Douglas ate lamb's quarters when he was little because he's from a poor Scottish family who had to have it. So that's the what he likes. So again, what he's saying applies to him no. <laughs> more than anything else. And when he takes these things back to Europe, they have a, they they look at them as on them as weeds for the most part. I mean, do you like Himalayan blackberries? <laughs> some people like them, and some people like the native blackberries better. It's 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 the the plants turn out to have way more power than we usually give them, and the way that they move around is incredibly subtle. And it's only being revealed in chromosomal analysis now. Uh, uh, fireweed is a huge bad problem weed in Scandinavia and Northern Europe. Douglas is the reason, because he took some of our fireweed back and crossed it with European firewood, which is the same species and looks just the same. One has 18 chromosomes and one has 36. A pretty recent paper, but that's hybrid vigor. That creates the hybrid vigor that allows it to take off. And so Douglas gets blamed for that as well. He doesn't get any credit for bringing salmonberry and salal berries because they're so mealy and awful. <laughs> What's that? He said, I, like I know, I know. If you develop a taste for them, they're delicious. That's, that's the main thing. But he's, 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 just to go through and do his taste stuff is really fun. I mean, he, he's eating Columbia ground squirrels and saying, boy, this is pretty sage, sage tasting meat we got going on here. And, and, um, but he'll try anything. He'll try almost anything. He turns down a couple of things. But he, he's a good sport about trying stuff. Well, you know, if you're at somebody's house for supper and they serve you something, it's pretty rude not to try. I wonder if, uh, was Thomas Jefferson still alive at that time? I mean, this is the period when... Didn't he die in 1825? 18, so he's just at, so he's dead. He's, he's dead, dead when Douglas is coming around the horn. I'm just wondering if, because of the conflict over whether this was going to become part of the British Empire, part of the United States, if Douglas was considered a threat. Oh, here's how this works. He's here. He's, he comes here because of that. They, they, pa they passed, a, they had a, you know, they're trying to figure out the boundary. In 1822, they had a meeting and said, we'll figure it out later. But that means you start jockeying for position. In the world of imperialism, as it was, the rules as they were played then is scientific data counted as points. So, the governors of the Hudson's Bay Company say, you should have somebody come in here and get some scientific data. Hudson's Bay Company says, no, because we're holding it close. We don't want anybody in here right now. And by 1825, and it, Douglas was going to come here in 1824 or 1823. They weren't ready yet. They were still having some administrative stuff. George Simpson was coming on. John McLaughlin was coming on. It's like your history of Oregon from a scientific viewpoint. When they get straight, when Simpson says, okay, we're going to, we know we're probably going to lose everything south of the Columbia. We'll close down Astoria, Fort George, and open up a new fort on the north side of the river. And then just assume we'll get everything north of the river. Because that's the way it should have been, according to David Thompson's maps and, you know, how, how they worked it out. So, yes, you're, the answer is all that's true. But it pales before the fact that Thomas Jefferson had this vision of a, crossing the continent. And you had to have a safe deep water port for that to happen. And the mouth of Columbia was killing everybody because it's so hard to get out on. So Puget Sound becomes what you have to have. And that, that trumps everything. So Douglas, when he's back in England, they ask, he writes a report for the colonial office saying everything north of 46 and the river should be British. And here's why. And here's all this scientific data. Doesn't matter. By 1846, it doesn't matter. You know, the Brits are lucky it wasn't 54 or 40, right? So yeah, that's the right, and, and as you go through this, it's like economics, history, it, all these things are threading through what Douglas is doing, plant by plant. I've got to ask, what, what do you think he would have written if he'd gone through such a period? 
Oh, he would have made a big mess out of it and thrown it away, or lost it, or died, or something. He, again, he, he was a difficult character. That's one of the most, that's the, one of the reasons he's easy to like. He, was a, he had a lot of rough edges to him. He did great when he was out, but back in London, he really struggled, as did, as did many of these Scottish kids. When they got back into this really strict class society, why would they not struggle? You know, they were nothing back in England. He was getting paid less than the doorkeeper at the Horticultural Society. And, and um, it would have been a great adventure to go back through Siberia, but again, it's, there's not many people that have the mind to put all that together. You know, von Humboldt could have put it together, Darwin could have put it together, maybe, but, but I don't think he would have gotten it together. And yet, when you read what he wrote for the draft of this book, he, his contract was with Murray, who was the guy who published Origin and Species, a big publishing house, and Pride and Prejudice too, for that matter. He, he writes beautifully. His letters are gorgeous prose. Everybody could write nicely at that time, and he, he makes all these great clunky jokes, and he, he's, he's fun. But he's just not built for what, we, you know, he's not built to be a large scientific figure the way these other guy was. He's too much of a regular guy, which I think is why he did so well when he was here. The fur trade guys understood where he was at. The tribes understood him. They could tease him. They could fool around. He could make mistakes. He could fall in holes. He, he did it all the time. You know, he's just a fun guy to have around in that sense. Okay, well, thank you very much. This is a... Uh